that I, I participated on a trip to uh, Berlin a few years ago, and that was when I was exposed for the first time in depth um, to this complicated city, this divided city. And um, yeah, so, so I have to say that basically my research interest was ignited that, that trip. So in particular, thank you to Germany close up. So <clears throat> to the matter at hand, so Germany is, is I'm sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna try to put this here. I think it's gonna be easier for me. Okay. Um, can you hear me like this? Okay. You know what? That's trade. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Is this better? Yes. Okay. Great. Wonderful. So Germany is is a complicated place for Jews and for Jewish Israelis, right? It's the place of birth on the one hand, the place of birth of enlightenment, where we have figures like Immanuel Kant and uh, philosopher Immanuel Kant and writer Goethe. Um, and uh, people such as, or basically Moses Mendelssohn, who was the first Jew, if not one of the first Jews, to assimilate and be accepted into German society um, as almost an equal. Um, but it's also a place of, uh, of the apocalypse, right? Where years of persecution against Jews in Europe came to its deadliest manifestation in the form of the Holocaust. It's almost as if modernity that was that began the trajectory that began with enlightenment turned on its head and turned against the Jews in a very mechanized way um, through the Holocaust. And so it's not the most obvious place for Israelis to choose to go to, right? And for Israelis to leave Israel is a very complicated matter. Um, they there used to be a stigma, they, you, they were used to be labeled as Yodim, meaning those who went down um, or led, and they were considered to be as not traitors, but as deserters. And to go to Germany, of all places, I can tell you, I mean, I don't know how many of you have heard the responses in the Israeli media, um, it's not, there are mixed, mixed responses. Um, and I can tell you that from my own experience, uh, going home to Israel, when I tell people what I do, so it's not always taken in a very positive way, or what the Israelis are doing there is not taken in a positive way. Um, and I've, had, I've heard comments such as, oh, how could they do that? And I hate them, and to Berlin of all places, so to Germany, um, yeah. So, so this is, it's not, it's not an easy, it's not an easy thing, it's not an intuitive place to go to because also it's not a place that Israelis go to uh, to better their economic conditions, right? If they want to make money, where do they come? To the United States. Or they would go to Canada, or they would go to Australia. Um, they would not go to Germany. The, the goal doesn't lie in the streets in Berlin, right? And also, um, growing up in Israel, um, the Holocaust is, is a formative event in our, uh, sorry, formative event in our uh, history. Um, and even if the grandparents of somebody are from Morocco, nevertheless, nevertheless, it feels as if they were on the trains to Auschwitz. There is, in Israel, there's the yearly commemoration day of, um, for the memory of the Holocaust and heroism, and um, there are trips to concentration camps, sorry, to extermination camps to Auschwitz. Uh, there are school trips um, to Yad Vashem, the Holocaust um, Museum in, um, in Jerusalem. And I have to say that, having done research on that, the Holocaust is mentioned, I could say, surely every day in at least one of the media outlets. Um, so, so even though it's supposedly over with and or hist very, very much in the history, it's still very much alive within an Israeli um, consciousness. So, and then when you go to Berlin, I have to say, I've been living there, living there for five months now, and it's a city that nothing, nothing is neutral in it. I lived in New York where I did my master's uh, and my PhD studies, and it's a completely different experience. So first of all, the German language. Um, so my interviewees, for my research, I'm interviewing Israelis that are living there. Um, um, almost all of my, my interviewees have told me that at first hearing German was very, almost traumatic for them, very difficult. Um, also, 
Germany and, and Berlin, even Berlin, even cosmopolitan Berlin, is not a very easy place to integrate into. Um, if Israelis that have been there for years and speak German don't feel that they speak it um, well enough, and um, so there's, there's, it's, it's, um, so they are tend some to to have friends, have English speaking uh, German friends, or um, or some there is. Well, I'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, they don't feel that they have completely integrated. Um, also, my interviewees have told me that when they see um, it, old people walking in the streets, they think about, oh, what were they involved? Were they not involved? So again, nothing. Um, Everything is, is loaded with meaning. Um, and then Berlin is like a living museum for the Holocaust. That's how I feel about it. And I'm not talking about the big uh, memorial site, for, for instance, the one in the center of Berlin. Um, I'm talking more about the smaller, spontaneous um, individual memorial that were, or that were um, created by individuals. So does anyone here know about the stumbling stones in Berlin, what they are? Right, these golden plates and uh, that are embedded in the sidewalks outside of homes from which Jews were taken. So these are privately initiated. I mean, the people in the homes call upon artists who are embedding these these, um, these golden uh, stones in the pavement, and in which you can find the names of the name of the person that was taken, where they were killed, and which uh, extermination camp, and the years of like their date of birth and date of death. Um, I can tell outside of my house, there are five. You know, again, you come home late at night, you go in the morning, you see that. Um, there are also, outside of the Kadeve, do people know what the Kadeve is in Berlin? Yeah, it's like the, the Barneys. Um, the nicest department store I've ever been to, and I lived in New York, so I've been to quite nice department stores. Um, so outside, by the train station, there is a plaque with names of extermination camps. And it's unavoidable, and you try to ignore it, but you know, still seeing Dachau, Theresienstadt, Auschwitz, it registers somehow. Um, yeah, I was, uh, my parents came to Berlin recently, and we took uh, a tour in the city, a walking tour. And I learned that I live in Mitte, at the center. I learned that Mitte um, is basically, was a, a neighborhood in which um, there were a lot of Jewish refugees that came from the east. Uh, from Eastern Europe, um, and and then basically, so it was like kind of a slum area, or or um, in which they lived, and also, I mean, I'm not going to continue to <laughs> with all of the things that are, are continuously um, around you. So, so what are so what are these Israelis doing there? And it's not neutral, right? This very loaded, complicated place. These, um, so. <clears throat> The numbers are between 12,000 to 20,000. Nobody knows exactly how much they come and go. Some of them have got EU passports, so they don't have to register. Um, so it's, it's, it's very hard to keep track. Um, they are embraced by the German government, I, I have to say. They get, which the German government, let me say, is extremely generous with fellowships and scholarships. and. Um, yeah, for artists and academics, and and apparently Israel is among um, few countries such as the U.S., Japan, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, I believe, um, that are granted. It's much easier for them to get um, artist visas or to get all sorts of visas. So we have like from the top down, there, there's an embracing of this uh, immigration. And then what the Israelis are doing there, they're opera singers. Um, I'm following specifically one opera singer that moved there to launch her career. Um, they compose uh, classical music. Um, they are academics, um, and uh, and then they they are involved in the startup scene, as was mentioned here. Um, and then many of them are want to enjoy the Ber what Berlin offers today to the Spanish and the Italians in the form of this. Bohemian lifestyle, right? Berlin is extremely, extremely affordable. It was shocking for me when I moved there from New York to see the prices. I'm like, this cannot be so. And it's euros, which is a little bit more than a dollar, right? So nevertheless, um, you can get by really well and very little. Um, so, so yeah, so they're living their, these li their lives. 
And what I see, one of the most interesting things that I see that is created there today is a cultural center. And it's so interesting that we, we have this cultural center created in Berlin, of all places, um, that is based on the Hebrew language. So here there are translation projects that are going on, translating uh, German texts into Hebrew. Um, there is, has anyone heard of Spitz, the magazine? No, okay. So Spitz is an online magazine that comes out in Hebrew. Um, and actually, no, they also have a hard copy that they deliver to people's houses uh, once a month. And it's the most hip, the most um, up-to-date, interesting, uh, deep uh, magazine that, that comes, I mean, or form of publication um, I almost wish in Israel there was something like that. Um, and it talks about, so every month there's a feature that somebody who just came to Berlin and how they um, assimilate and the difficulties and what kind of art they're doing there or academic work or high tech work. Um, they speak about all of the um, joint uh, art projects of the Israeli artists and German artists. So I can tell you that when I want to know about the most up-to-date um, things that are that the Israelis are involved with, um, I look at Shabit. So that's something that's really interesting that's going on there. Thank you, Mark. Uh, first, I want to applaud the work of Action and Reconciliation. Uh, I admire what you do. I, I wish you great success in the years ahead. Uh, let me offer some personal background to this entire issue of uh, German-Israeli-Jewish relations. I was born in 1938, so I was alive during the worst years of the Holocaust. And I am a member of that generation that swore that I would never step foot in Germany. 
1964, my wife and I were flying Icelandic Airlines to Luxembourg to spend a year traveling in Europe. And suddenly there's an announcement on the airplane loudspeaker that uh, Luxembourg was fogged in and we were landing in Frankfurt, Germany. I nearly had a heart attack. I literally had a, a panic attack. We landed in Frankfurt, they put us on a bus, they drove us finally to Luxembourg. Uh, the next year, we returned to Europe and my car was supposed to land in Antwerp, Belgium. And we waited patiently in Antwerp, finally went to the authorities and they said, oh, the ship has been rerouted, you have to pick up the car in Bremerhaven, Germany. Uh, we drove from Bremerhaven through Germany, all through Czechoslovakia, Poland, and 2,000 miles through the Soviet Union. That was 1966. The breakthrough for me really came from the Conrad Adenauer Foundation, with whom the American Jewish Committee has a very, very close relationship. We have an exchange program. And as director of the American Jewish Committee here in New England, it was my responsibility to host 10 young people at the midpoint of their professions who were coming to Boston and New York uh, for this exchange program. And that was an extraordinary experience. I finally, for the first time in my life, spent quality time with young Germans and my perspective changed. The very next year, um, I co-founded the German Jewish Dialogue Group here in Boston. There were already two groups in process. I did this with the German consulate. And that German Jewish Dialogue Group, believe it or not, is now in its 23rd year. And there are people sitting in this room who are members of the original meeting in 1993. Uh, because of this, I was invited in 1994 by the Press and Information Ministry of Germany to spend 10, day, 10 days in Germany on a VIP trip, all alone with simply an interpreter, meeting government dignitaries and cultural figures and ordinary people. Um, we've been meeting for 23 years, telling stories, and for whatever reason, our interest in each other has been sustained for more than two decades. Uh, there are all kinds of interesting psychological, sociological, and historic uh, aspects to this dialogue group that I'll be happy to discuss further, but time is short. I want to throw out some challenges for the discussion this evening. You've heard uh, all about the very compatible relationship between Germany and Israel. Uh, and there's no question that this is really a very healthy relationship. But here is the problem. Uh, there is a disparity between the very good relationship between Israel and Germany at the government level, but there's an increasing gap between uh, the people in the street. Uh, the Conrad Adenauer Foundation came up with an interesting poll. 70% of Israelis like Germany and they like Germans, as evidenced by the 17,000 Israelis that are now living in Berlin, which Das will talk about, I'm sure. But on the German side, according to the latest Anti-Defamation League um, poll and study, about 20% of Germans harbor latent anti-Semitic views equivalent to what you'll find in almost any other country, including the United States. There was a Bertelsmann poll that I think we have to pay attention to. 38% of Germans expressed a positive attitude toward Israel, but 48% expressed a negative attitude toward Israel. And 54% of young Germans expressed a negative attitude toward Israel. 81% of the Germans polled by the Bertelsmann Foundation want to leave the Holocaust behind. 58% they want to draw a line under the Holocaust. A fascinating issue that has come up repeatedly in our dialogue group, and I think we should be discussed at some point perhaps tonight, is the radically different lessons learned by Jews from the Holocaust as opposed to Germans from the Holocaust. For Jews, the lesson of the Holocaust is that we will never again be victimized. And 
if violence is necessary to protect our Jewish interests, that is what we have to do. But to the Germans, the Holocaust means that violence is abhorrent and must be negated under almost all circumstances. 82% of Germans, 82% of Israelis want Germany to continue the armed service that has been crucial to Israel's security. But 68% of Germans would like to see it end. Um, what's ahead? Germany will clearly remain the economic powerhouse of the European Union. There's no question about it. Everybody in the world wants to buy German products. Uh, they're highly skilled, they're quality products, and Germany will continue to triumph in this area. I think now it's the fourth largest economy in the world. But here's my concern. Uh, we hear all the time, I've been to Germany seven times on various trips, study trips. I did an interview project in Berlin and in Hamburg. I interviewed dozens and dozens of Germans on the whole question of German identity. It fascinates me. How do Germans identify themselves? How do they achieve a kind of coherent sense of their Germanness while incorporating the 12 years of the Third Reich? I find this a very fascinating issue. But the young generation we hear again and again is somewhat fed up with hearing about the Holocaust. And speaking as a objective, rational, logical citizen of the world, I can well understand their attitude. If I were a young person, I would hate to be constantly reminded that my people, my culture, my country committed the most unspeakable crime in human history. That would drive me half crazy. But speaking as a Jew, I'm deeply disturbed by this attitude for two major reasons. Number one, if the coming generations of Germans really want to end their preoccupation with the Holocaust, that means a possible effacement of the memory of the six million Jews who died. Number two, it could lead, and we see in poll after poll, a possible distancing of Germany from support of Israel at a time when Israel is increasingly isolated and, in my opinion, relentlessly misunderstood. Maybe the issue really is Holocaust education, and I'm happy to see that Yad Vashem in Israel is now partnering with the Ministry of Education in Germany, hopefully to come up with more creative and stimulating and retentive ways of teaching the Holocaust. We'll see. Anyway, these are the issues I want to share with you this evening. I look forward to further discussion in the question and answer period. Thank you.